Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and today we're going to be looking at one of the most common beginner questions or topics, and that is what game to start with. Now, almost everybody that comes into the world of game development does it because they love a particular game, and a lot of times they want to go ahead and implement that game. And to be honest, completely demoralizingly honest, you can't. You want to create GTA 5 tomorrow? You can't. You want to create Baldur's Gate? You can't. It's there's a learning curve. There's definitely a learning curve. Now you can eventually, or you can as part of the team eventually, but to start off with such an unrealistic expectation is just to doom yourself to failure. Now I don't ask you to forget your dreams. Don't ever do that. Uh, but what I do want you to do is realize that that's not where you should be starting. Now do take the game idea you ultimately want to create and always use it as motivation. Use it to decide what I need to learn next. But what you don't realize as a beginner at day one or day 100 is the complexity involved. Even in the simplest of game, when you start breaking it down, there is so much more complexity under the, the, um, the surface that you need to learn about before you're going to be really effective. So you shouldn't jump straight in with the biggest game you wanna create. Now I wanna address three upfront myths that people that are starting out think um, about making games that are just, as I said, myths. Um, first off is, uh, I'm gonna take GTA 5, for example, or a, a racing game. I want to create this racing game, but in order to you know make it doable for myself, I'm going to make it a lot simpler by only, say, having two cars. So instead of having 100 cars in the game, I'm just going to create two cars, and that's going to make me have to do... Um, you know, 2% of the work. It doesn't work that way. That's the first thing you should be aware of right up front is actually the majority of work in game development is front loaded. Why, what I mean by that is to create that first working uh, vehicle, to implement that first vehicle, to get the, the pipeline set up so you can get your art in the game, to get the physics working right, to get it um, imported and um, displayed properly in your game takes a hundred times more than it does to do the second car, the third car, the fourth car. Once you get to that point, it's almost an assembly line there. Now there is definitely, um, by reducing the amount of assets needed in your game, you are reducing the complexity, um, the, sorry, the amount of work involved, but you are not reducing the complexity. You still have all the same number of problems to solve, the same mountain to climb, the same learning curve to get over. Uh, it's, you know, you really only have the learning curve the first time. And then after that, uh, you know, it is just an assembly line from that point on. But that first initial learning curve is what is going to kill you as a beginner. So thinking that, okay, I'll take something huge, you know, and just make smaller levels or less content, it doesn't work that way. The workload is still going to bury you. And as I said, it is all front loaded. Now, the next one that comes up, and this one's quite common, is I'm going to use at art assets off of the internet. And this one is really um, understandable because one of the places where the majority of people are going to have a hang up right off the front is, um, you know, programming is a skill, art is a skill, and generally you can learn one or the other at a time. Potentially you can learn one or the other, period. Um, so a lot of programmers will struggle to find art or a lot of artists will struggle to find programmers. And what you run into in that scenario is the, the sirens call of, oh look, here's this website that has, say, uh, starships uh, available for free for download. I can download them and I can make my own starship game. This is not how it works. I just gotta warn you right up front. Those models you see on the internet, nine times out of 10 are completely useless for use in a game, especially a 3D game. Now they might look good, they might render well, but when it comes down to it at the end of the day, they almost always won't work in a game engine. I find myself as an experience, I, I actually can work in 3D. I can model and tweak these things. And I still find a lot of times it's faster for me to start from scratch than to use this crap. Now, there are a couple of exceptions here. Um, Unity asset stores or the Unreal Engine asset stores, generally you will find assets that drop into those particular engines and work a whole lot better. On top of that, you have um, game 3D game packages such as Game Guru that come with a whole bunch of content for you to get started with. And these are good approaches to um, learning how to get going. Uh, I think one of the number one things you can do as a beginner is actually um, start with a fully defined set of game assets. I'm actually working on a project to create some right now so that people actually have all of the pieces that you need to build. It's a lot like those um, services that are out there right now that teach you how to cook, but also give you the instructions, give you all the ingredients, etc. Well, there are packages out there like that. Now, the problem in that scenario is you can't move beyond it. That is, if there's an asset missing, um, that you particularly need for your game and you don't have the ability to acquire it, you're dead. 
and that's the problem with starting off that level. Now, um, there's no easy solution here. What you can do, and uh, what I really generally re uh, expect you to do, is find a, a, a source that has everything you need to create a self-contained game and use it. Or start off and you know, create simple programmer art. Create a game that has minimalistic artistic requirements and work your way up. Uh, at the end of the day, the, the game created by a single programmer is becoming increasingly rare. In fact, if you want an idea of scope, going back to even like the Grand Theft Auto uh, example, take a look at the end credits of one of these games sometimes and you will see that not even it's not even a single person that creates the character that you're dealing with in the game in a AAA title. One person will model it, one person will texture it, one person may rig it, and another one may animate it. So you may have this thing going through four or five different hands, and then it's handed off to the uh, people that are in charge of the pipeline that actually import that into the game. And at this point, there's a programmer that takes over and does things like, um, or maybe possibly a designer at this point that does things like creates the artificial intelligence state machine that drives how that thing's gonna run in the game. Of course, you've got a programmer that actually wrote the code to handle that. Um, artificial intelligence, you have the game engine that did all the nav meshes so that it doesn't fall through the world, etc. The complexity is massive on some of these titles. So define your scope as good as possible and don't think that just I can grab this, this looks good on the internet, I can grab it and throw it in. It just doesn't work that way. Now there are some opportunities out there. There's, um, let's see, there's uh, uh, Kenny NL is one of the common examples. Uh, there's Oh, what was the other one? These guys commercially sell 2D packages. Uh, Cartoon Smart has a set of 2D sprite packages where you you know you basically buy a side platformer with animated characters type thing. And then as I said, Kenny and L has a several uh, kits that are freely available. Now the fact that they're freely available means you will see them everywhere. A lot of game engines use them for the tutorial examples. Creating a unique game using these assets is not generally a great idea because it's going to look just like everything else. But learning using them is definitely worth it. At the same time. You can get the bits and bobs and pieces that you need in the asset stores for your game engines. Or you can use a game engine that ships with a number of assets that you can start and play with. And these are all great ways to go. Now, I do want you to be aware that when you start seeing, oh, I could use this piece and I want to use that piece and I want to use this piece, the other problem you're going to run into there, if you don't get them all from the same source, even if they all come from the um, the app store, the art store uh, attached to your game engine, if there's n not the same artist, your artistic style is going to clash horribly. And then you're going to still need some ability in dealing with um, the 3D packages, etc., for you know getting them all down to the same size, things like that. Um, so don't look at internet assets as being the be all end all uh, solution to your problem, because sadly enough, they aren't. The biggest solution to your problem is to limit your scope. Uh, finally, is game engines. Now, um, I think everyone starting out should start with game engines. I think building your own game engine is a valuable. Um, it's a valuable activity if you want to learn how things work. It's one of those things I don't discourage anyone from doing, but I do discourage you from doing it up front. You will be amazed by how much a game engine will do for you. Uh, also, it will teach you how to build a better game engine if you decide to build one from scratch yourself. However, the, um, the game engine has generally what you will find is you can learn a whole lot up front very fast, but do expect a huge amount of hiccups when you start running into the limitations of a game engine. And that's where the problems are. When someone else creates a game engine, it means that you have to learn how they did it, and if they didn't do it the way that you would expect it to do, or they didn't do something you need, well, that's a limitation you now somehow have to deal with. So a game engine is definitely a route you should take, uh, but do be aware that there are limitations there, and there is a huge learning curve in any, in any game engine. Even the simplest game engine has a pretty big learning curve. Now, as a beginner, there are game engines out there that are very, uh, uh, very much uh, more accessible to you. Things like uh, Stencil, um, Game Maker, Construct, etc. To name just a few, uh, these are very. Um, beginner experimentation friendly game engines. So this would be a great place to check things out. Uh, Unreal Engine and Unity have such a huge community that you can you know, cut and paste your way to success. Um, but do be aware that the learning curve is a lot higher there. Now to get back to the actual games themselves, what should you start with if you shouldn't start with your dream project? Well, you should start with a series of projects that give you the tools you need to build your dream project. Now I put together a post, I will link it down below. I wrote this, uh, 
2013, so it's been a little bit, but this stuff's pretty timeless. It doesn't go um, you know, out of date. So the examples I'm giving here are just as applicable now as they were when I wrote them. And this is not, you know, I'm not saying go and do all of these games. I'm saying these games will help you and teach you uh, the things you need to know, and they'll progress in an order of difficulty that will make your life uh, you know, your progression more successful. And they also will teach you things that are, are essential to the most complex games out there. And these are the kind of things that you can pump out in a day or two or a week or two, not a year or two. And when you're just starting out, building on your own success is probably the biggest thing you can do. So back to where you could start. One of the easiest things to start with is a text adventure. Now, don't get me wrong, a text adventure can actually be very, very complicated complicated, but it doesn't have to be. And start simple. You know, there's one of the nice things with a text adventure. First off, there's no graphics. Um, and depending on the language you're working with, that can actually really simplify things. Like in C++, graphics are not built in, for example. So you have a learning curve there of, you know, getting and configuring a graphics library, learning that library on top of the programming language and on top of creating games. So there are definitely um, catches there. Um, you can you know, if you stick to a text adventure, that takes graphics out of the equation. Now, a text adventure can scale in complexity. You can start off with a what's your name, oh, hello, blah, 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 name, and then you can start building up a world data structure that um, does things like, uh, you know, here if I go west, this is here, this description there, north, this is here, that's there. Then you can build on top of that, you can add in uh, fighting, random number generator, a combat system, an inventory system, and you can build out the complexity of a text adventure as far as you want to go until, of course, you want to start adding graphics. So text adventures are a great place to start, and there's actually a lot more there than you probably expect there to be. Uh, next one up is probably Hangman. Now, Hangman uh, is nice because it doesn't require graphics specifically, but it can have graphics. So if you want to move into the, your very simple beginning first graphics adventure, um, Hangman is a great choice. Next thing is we're also going to start to get into actually implementing algorithms, uh, you know, matching the word, that kind of stuff, part of the uh, scenario there. And like I said, it can be a nice introduction to the world of graphics, but you can easily implement it without graphics first. And the nice thing uh, about Hangman is there's absolutely no requirement for artificial intelligence, which leads me on to my next suggestion, which is tic-tac-toe. Now, tic-tac-toe, again, can be done non-graphically if you want, or you can obviously create it and make it a little bit um, spiffier with graphics or even animations if you want to add it. Where tic-tac-toe is very nice is it's the beginning, the introduction to artificial intelligence. And what you need to learn here, basically, when you get down to it, once you, you know what you're doing here, um, you'll start learning something called the min-max algorithm. It's the way of solving Solving, um, you know, what the optimal route is to go in tic-tac-toe. And then you also run into the first real kind of gotcha you're going to have with AI is tic-tac-toe, it's so easy to create a perfect AI. And that's that's not fun as a game either. So then you start looking at some of the challenges behind artificial intelligence. Now, the nice thing is with the link I put together with all of these suggestions, there's also code suggestions or examples that will actually walk you through what you need to learn. They've also got some examples about, um, you know, the algorithms behind it. Now, the next one up I recommend is Pong. Um, now, Pong can be exchanged with Arkanoid, various other games along those lines, but it's a simple animated graphics app. Uh, so here you've got to get, you're into graphics world, you're also into the math world, which is what some, something that we've nicely avoided until now. Tic-tac-toe, I guess, has a little bit of math, but for the most part, you had no... Um, you know, algebra or geometry type stuff. This is your introduction to game math. On top of that, you have a little bit on artificial intelligence, although it's very, very, very minimal. Uh, the, again, the big thing you're going to have to do figure out there is how to make it so that your game doesn't play perfectly, uh, because it's very easy for a computer to be perfect at Pong. Uh, but here you are getting into um, a lot more things. You're getting into real-time input from the player. You're getting into implementing a game loop, which is a very important concept. Uh, scoring, game state, uh, various other things like this. It's a very useful um, uh, project to start with, but it's also simple enough that you're not going to be overwhelmed with it. Um, as I said, Breakout is another way to go. Now, Asteroids is another nice uh, example. It's simple like uh, Breakout or Pong, but implements... Um, you know, moving on multiple axes. There's a bit more, uh, you know, involvement there in the, uh, you know, it's not just a paddle going left and right. Uh, you also get into things like spawning entities, like bullets, uh, dealing with expiring, uh, you know, you're 
your rocks when you shoot them need to go away. So you need to write all the game logic to handle that stuff. Uh, so it's a bit more complicated. You're getting into things like collision detection, a little bit more detailed, uh, but you also have to cover that in Pong. So it's a nice progression. Now next up we've got um, Pac-Man is a great one to implement because Pac-Man is still relatively simple, uh, but you start getting into uh, your AI is a bit more complicated. You're going to probably learn about state machines, uh, which is a great concept, which by the way, I've already done a video on. I'll link that down below if you're interested in that as well. Um, Pac-Man also introduced levels for the first time. So this is where, you know, all the previous games were single screen, uh, single level. Uh, Pac-Man, you can potentially implement multiple levels as you're going through. Uh, the co it's a little bit more complicated, and the nice thing is you now have to deal with maps of some form. It would be a great time to learn about, say, Tiled, the map editor. Or if you're using a 2D game engine such as Game Maker, there's probably a Tiled map editor already built in, but it's time to go ahead and learn that. Now, to take one step further from the Pac-Man level, you get into the standard platform. And this is a great next step. Uh, here you can learn um, a bit more, basically basic physics, jumping, falling, not falling. Uh, you require more advanced collision detection than you've already had. You're probably going to want to get into things like sprite orientation so you know when your character's on the ground. Uh, you're going to have to take the level one step further than you did in the last one in your level detail, your level difficulty, but you're still going to be dealing with multiple levels. You could argue um, that Pac-Man and platformers are actually the same learning curve, and I can I can get that. You know, I could see picking one or the other, to be honest, but I would say a platformer is probably a little bit more difficult. Now, from this point on, I would probably move off into 3D. Now, the, the basics that you've learned, if you're interested in 3D, if you've got no interest in 3D, no need to learn it. But the basics that you just learned, things like um, the algorithms, the AI, the state machines, the input handling, the game loop, those are all going to carry over. And all of this stuff sort of builds on the previous task. Now, these are just simple examples I came up with and the reasons behind them. There are you know, dozens of other things. But the thing is, you want to focus on simple. You want to learn it. You want to build from the success. You want to get motivated because of the you know you you did have success, and then you want to move on to the next thing. Now there are a couple of shortcuts, and some of these shortcuts are actually fairly good, depending on where your perspective is. Uh, the one approach is you can mod an existing game, and this isn't a bad way to learn. Actually, is you can download something that already works, that comes with source code, that comes with full assets. And one of the nice areas where this comes in is there's a project or a, a program called Ludum Dare. That's it's like monthly game projects, and a lot of times they release the full source code. Uh, for the projects, and they're simple games that were created over a couple of days. Well, you can take this source code, mess around with it, play with it, see what the end result is, and learn that way. Basically, learn by dissection. And when you're talking about if the game is controlled with a scripted engine, something like uh, a Python or a JavaScript or Lua, where you can actually go in there and change the code, save it, and immediately see the results, that's a massive way of learning. Uh, now, another option here, especially if your interest lies in this direction, is you can get into a project like um, RPG Maker, where you're dealing with, you're almost using an application more than a game engine, but you can drop down below it and get into the game code, into the specifics. You know, it's taking care of a lot of the nuts and bolts for you, and it's very streamlined and specified towards a particular genre of game. But this could also be a great introduction to the programming concepts, especially when you start running into the walls because of these tools not having the functionality you needed. That's when you have to look beyond and you have to learn and go deeper and look behind the curtain. But these give you all of the basic assets and tools you need to get started in experimenting and then have that initial success to build on. Uh, so that's it for today. I hope that didn't come across sounding so preachy. Uh, it wasn't meant to. This was totally meant, uh, you know, I'm not trying to tell you to kill your dreams, to not make your uh, multiple, massively multiple uh, online role-playing game of your dreams or the uh, next version of Baldur's Gate or, um, you know, Grand Theft Auto 76. Whatever it is in your head, hold on to that dream. Just do realize that that dream is pretty much unattainable right now. Uh, even if you did work on it and you managed to, like, you know, iteratively slamming your head against the wall to all the steps you need to get to where you need to go, you very inefficiently used your time. You're better off starting with these smaller projects and learning on your success. This is the kind of stuff you can do in a couple of weeks. And at the end of that couple of weeks, you are so far ahead of where you will be if you start with your huge, massive project. Uh, so that's the advice I can give here. If you don't like it, just ignore it. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to approach, um, you know, how you want to do things. This, this is uh, my opinion on the subject, uh, but hopefully you did find that useful. And if you did, please do click like. And of course, uh, we do all kinds of game development related stuff here. And if that sounds interesting to you, please do click subscribe. All right, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed that, found that useful. See you all later. Goodbye.